So I sent out a tweet, I believe, at noon today, telling everybody, those 17 followers, that I'll be heading up here tonight. And Jeff uh, actually uh, reminded me that I hired him two and a half years ago at this event for VR, for where he stayed until we had an exit to Outbrain, for where he's still employed. So uh, hopefully we'll hire another smart guy tonight, <laughs> and in two and a half years I'll be back again, and we'll have a wonderful exit uh, in between, if uh, we could be so lucky. Uh, I'll tell a very short story, and then I'll have Marcus uh, kind of elaborate on the exact same theme from a different angle. So we've set out to do nothing more than schedule meetings. No more, no less. And I think we've all had some understanding of exactly what amount of pain comes into you trying to set up a meeting, whether that be with a friend, customer, partner, or somebody else. I did the rather sad thing of actually counting my own meetings in 2012 for where I think I was up here uh, that year. And I did 1,019 meetings and I had 672 reschedules. What a bunch of fuckers, huh? <laughs> that is hard work, I tell you. And I'm sure our investors would have had me hire a PA or some sort of assistant that could have helped me out. I didn't. Super frugal, startup founder and all of that good stuff. So I did every single one of them by hand. And by hand, certainly for the last 20 some odd years, have meant I send you an email, I say, hey, my name is Dennis, good time to meet up for a cup of coffee. You reply back, you say Wednesday, I say Thursday, you say one, I say two, I say 48 wall, you say midtown, I say mm, sure, and we end up meeting up once you send out that invite. That just haven't changed. Doesn't mean that people haven't tried to solve this before. We've tried to solve this over the last decade and a half, and there's not an extension, plugin, app, web service, what have you, that haven't tried to remove this. I'm just not so sure that any one of those really solved the problem. And what's really fascinating, to me at least, is that the one thing that survived was that human personal assistant. She's still in the front office, and she's still the best solution which we have. She's just super expensive. So you pay 45K to remove the pain for you to be able to say, hey, Amy, set something up between John and I, come end of next week at 48 Wall. Send, archive, and I don't want to think about it. All I want to see from Amy is an invite. And that's exactly what we're trying to build here. The only difference is that we don't want to do this as yet another app. I think you want to hit this one. Yet another app, yet another plugin, yet another extension. I want to be able to, if at all possible, recreate that experience of having that human in place. So there is no interface. There is no drop-down box. There is no set of possible times which you can click on. There's only Amy, which exists in dialogue as a CC. You ask her in plain English through exactly what I said before. Please, would you be so kind? Set up a meeting between John and I. Come in the next week at 48 Wall. It is then Amy's job to set out to have this human-human-like dialogue with the guest to the multiple participants and trying to come to conclude on exactly which day, at which time, at which address or phone number we're supposed to meet up. And I want her to be so good that just for a second there, you're a little bit in doubt of whether I've just hired 400 people in the Philippines. And if you think that, I'm cool. I won. Because then everything works exactly as the way it's supposed to. I will use my slide and then Marcus will use 20 slides to explain the same thing afterwards that I tried to convince investors when we set out in April, May this year of it not being a task of, hey, Dennis, tell me how many of the conversations that you have today are fully automated and how many of them do you have monkeys kind of working on? And it is just not as simple as that. And the whole thing is certainly complex to the extent that we cannot just have a kind of Boolean outcome of either machine or human. And what we kind of set out to do is to kind of create a setting for where there is no plan B. There is no kind of backup plan. And I know SoftBank kind of you know, 
shit their pants whenever I say that, but there is no plan B of, oh, perhaps we can just have humans do this a little bit faster in the future. There's only one for where we can go train on the data which we take in, which we might not understand now, but hopefully we will at some point in the future. And the more we can train on that, the more likely it is that we can hold this conversation. And that was certainly hard to explain over and over again, as in, why don't you want to show me that chart? So what is it? You don't know what it is? Or is it all human right now? And it's really just really mingled. And I hope Marcus will be able to explain that in greater detail. I'll try, definitely try. So thank you, Dennis, for that very nice introduction. My name's Marcos. I'm the data science lead um, at X.AI. OK, so that works. So just to reemphasize what Dennis uh, has been saying. Um, so X.AI, the, the way Amy works behind the scenes, Amy is the name of our artificial uh, scheduling assistant. The way she works behind the scenes is she's basically a set of different modules, some of which involve more machine learning than others. Um, and those, those modules kind of talk to each other. Right now, we're not fully automated. We're not 100% automated. Uh, we're just starting. But our plan is definitely to shoot for 100% automation. So let me just reemphasize what Dennis said. In terms of the human involvement in these different modules that compose sort of the behind the scenes of Amy, um, humans right now are they're not really taking over. They're not really acting as scheduling assistants. What they're acting as is what we call AI trainers. So they're sort of like overlooking what the machine is guessing. So they're doing a lot of uh, you know, QA. But they're also, in those instances where the machine guesses something wrong, they're annotating things and they're letting the machine know that, hey, that was wrong. You know, retrain, learn. Um, so eventually, our goal is to, once we go to full automation, kind of liberate the humans, um, which is that corner there, so that they can be happy and they can be you know, outside of this, of this chain. As I said, there's many, there's several modules that describe what Amy is behind the scenes. I'm only going to talk about three of them. So talk a little bit about the architectural design, so what overall, the overarching architecture of Amy. Uh, and then mention um, a heavy natural language processing piece and a heavy sort of user preference uh, analysis. Right? And I'll, I'll go more into what those things mean. OK, so first, you can think of Amy as a sort of conversation model, right? Where somebody sends Amy an email and says, hey, Amy, please schedule a meeting between me and somebody else. And so that spins up a bunch of logical questions. Is this person in our database? Yes, no. Did he propose time? Yes, no. Is there a location in the email? Yes, no, et cetera. And so it automatically spawns a bunch of branches in this tree. And then Amy starts a conversation with all the participants. And that automatically turns into another logical tree with each participant. But the thing is that branches in one tree, so what happens in one tree actually influences, goes across what's happening in another, in another branch. So it's kind of like you know, a directed graph, in a sense, but it's extremely complicated to think of it in those terms. So we think of it in a different way. Well, and by the way, I'm associating each of these modules to some region in the human brain, in Amy's brain. If there's any neuroscientists out there, I apologize. I have no idea what I'm talking about in terms of you know, what part of the brain does what. So it's just kind of, just bear with me. OK, so the way we think about it is more of changing state model. So the meeting starts in a given state where we have, you know, the person proposed a meeting. We have this information, this other information. We know this about the participant, et cetera. So it's sort of like, let me just point it out here. It's sort of like a collection of bits and pieces of information. And so when a state gets created, Amy has to look at it and take an action. And so that takes the meeting to the next state, right? Maybe the action was to send three or four emails to some participants in the host of the meeting. Now, one of the participants replies, and so that pops up a new piece of information, and so the state of the system changes, the state of the meeting. And so that prompts Amy to look at it again and make a decision, right? Amy's trying to, she's not making random decisions. She's not influencing the, you know, this change of state randomly. She's trying to converge, make the thing converge as fast as possible. 
She's trying to reduce ambiguity in the you know, time and location of the meeting at every step. She's trying to frame things such that it's easier for us to collect data when our users respond. And finally, she's of course trying to maximize everybody's happiness, which she does by having some idea of the user's preferences and also the participant's preferences. So this is an actual conversation with Amy. It's never this simple. So this is, the ping pong here is like four ping pongs. So somebody wrote an email to Amy and said, hey Amy, can you schedule a meeting? I think it was, so we altered the original names and I think now it's Dennis asking for a meeting with Matt, who's another one of our co-founders. Um, and so then the email comes in. We need to be able to classify it, say, recognize that somebody wants Amy to schedule a meeting. So that's a cat categorization problem. Then that spawns Amy looking at the user's preferences, et cetera, looking at all this bunch of information and putting together a template, which is the answer that Amy then sends to the participant, in this case, Matt. Um, after that, so that email gets sent out, and now Matt responds, one dash two works, right? So I guess if, if you're into natural language processing, you can see what the difficulty is here already. We need to be able to interpret this few words as, hey, somebody accepted a time that we proposed, and we need to know what that, what that time actually was. So let's say we classify that correctly, we do the information extraction correctly, the final step is now Amy sends out an invite, negotiations over. Again, it's never this simple. It's usually a much longer ping pong, bunch of branches with different participants, et cetera. Okay, so that leads uh, very naturally into natural language processing. Um, as I've said in the previous slide, there's the natural language processing problem breaks down into a classification problem and an information extraction problem, right? One dash two works, needs to be classified as somebody accepted a time, and then we need to go into that one dash two, recognize that that's a temporal expression, and extract an actual data from that. So let's talk first about the categorization problem. Um, we have about 25 atomic what I like to call atomic categories, which are basically represent the different purposes that an email that reaches us can have, right? This is kind of like a taxonomy of emails that we didn't really invent. It was more after scheduling you know, hundreds of meetings um, that it, the data itself revealed to us that this is the natural taxonomy for this case. Uh, you can see that you know, different categories have different frequencies type of typical features that we use to um, categorize the emails would be, of course, characteristic words. Uh, we do name identity recognition in the emails. Um, we look at parts of speech. So text comes in, we translate it to parts of speech, tags, and then we build syntactic rules that allow us to sort of discriminate between the different categories. But I think, I think the most important point is that because we are a singular domain, uh, project where we're limited to the context of negotiating emails, we can exploit uh, context categories. So properties of the meeting context. So we're not just looking at the text or at the properties of that email. We can look at the properties of the email that preceded that email. Right? So for example, was the time proposed in the previous email? If so, then it's very likely that this email, the person is either accepting or rejecting a time. So, because I know some, at least partial, of the audience is, is technical, I'll just quickly mention that for the categorization problem, we're using uh, SVMs. And we train a separate SVM for each uh, one of the classes that we have. So they w we do one versus all. We survey the parameter space. And so we are optimizing you know, an SVM for each intent class. So when the email comes in, we hit it with 25 different SVMs, and that spits out uh, which are the, you know, the classes that we think this email falls into. So here's an actual performance plot. 
Um, let's look at all the emails for which somebody was accepting a time um, as a function of the confidence level that we can associate to the support vector machine prediction. Support vector machines don't usually give you any confidence level with their prediction, but you can calculate something called plot scaling, which we do. And so that then you can sort of like get a confidence level to the prediction. And so what this is showing is the precision and the recall that we have for classifying this emails that are somebody's accepting at a time as a function of the confidence level. And so you can see that for high confidence levels, about half of the emails or the traffic of emails that come uh, where somebody's accepting a time, we can claim that we know that with about 97% accuracy. This is another class. So this is emails where somebody's proposing a new meeting Again, as a function of the confidence level. Uh, yeah, so they're telling me I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be fast. Uh, and you can see that we basically, for about 70% of the times that this come in, we nail it. So we know this is a new meeting proposal. Okay, the information extraction model. So we've been talking about classification. Now, information extraction. So 1 2 works. The problem is not necessarily knowing that 1-2 is a temporal expression. The problem is knowing that 1-2 actually refers to the 13th of November at 18 hours UTC, duration one hour, right? So it breaks down into, hey, I detected a time token, but now I need to resolve it uh, into an actual data point that I can use. And so again, here we're helped by the fact that we're singular domain we're working in the context of meeting negotiations, so we know that because this email, somebody accepted a time, we know that it refers to a time that somebody had proposed before. So it becomes, the resolution problem becomes more uh, a matching problem. So our model is emails come in, we classify them, and then we run an information extraction model depending on what class the email uh, falls into. The last um, topic that I want to cover is user preferences. This is a beautiful um, data science area in X.AI where if a user starts using us, they connect their calendar. And so suddenly we have a view of maybe the last two or three years of data in their calendar. So that means that we can extract their preferences or try to extract their preferences automatically. So for example, we can see um, meeting density. How are meetings distributed throughout the week for this person? Do they tend to cluster on Monday, Tuesday, and say Thursday mornings? Or does he like to distribute them evenly? We can see things like, what's the typical separation between meetings for this person, right? Or what's the typical time that this person likes to have lunch? And so, that gives us certain probability distributions that then guide the proposals that Amy makes on your behalf. So Amy's not just filling up empty buckets in your calendar. She's filling up empty buckets in order to try to reproduce what she deduces are your preferences. The problem becomes that much more interesting when there's several participants whom you have access to the calendars because then it's just a beautiful sort of probability convolution uh, model. So with that, I know I'm way over time. So there's a bunch more modules that are involved. I'm not really, haven't really had the time to go into them. We have a great data science team in place. Uh, we're actively hiring. Uh, so if you, you know, if you think this is interesting, just please approach us uh, after. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So this is fascinating, and as, as one of the uh, lucky uh, beta users, uh, I mean, what, what's unbelievable about this is how just incredibly well it works. I mean, like it's just 100% uh, uh, quality. So uh, I, I guess the question is um, automation versus humans. Uh, so what is your current thinking in terms of, um, you mentioned 100% as a target, but how far can you go you know, without uh, any major evolution in data science? Uh, you know, in the next uh, whatever, whatever time period, but in the, in the near future? So I think 
what really helps us is, the, again, the fact that we're a singular domain, that we're in the context of just scheduling meetings. Because what we're realizing is that a lot of these very tough problems, like resolving temporal expressions into actual timestamps or classifying emails based on you know, very sparse uh, data sets, um, really gets resolved by the fact that we can use, we can assume certain uh, context features that come from the fact that, hey, this email is part of a thread, and so we know what happened before, so that informs what's going to happen next with, with very, very high uh, correlation factors. So, Great. Uh, questions? Okay. Uh, Ellie Nomak, Garrett Asset Management. Frequently meetings involve travel. Yeah. And in terms of also travel, especially in into like um, cities outside of New York. Yes. How do you incorporate that in terms of timing, in terms of preferences, in terms of change of time, in terms of et cetera, et cetera? So Amy takes a number of items into consideration. The first one is just your preference for buffer timing between meetings. So you might just be a guy who likes back-to-back -back meetings, or you might not be. And she certainly takes the idea of location into consideration, not something which we solved in full, and I shouldn't sit here and advertise something which I believe we just nailed, but the whole idea of me having a meeting at the office doesn't take any travel time, and me having a meeting in mid-time will take some travel time. And I need to incorporate that into my date-time suggestions. So I don't suggest something which is just impossible to live up to. So that is certainly built into our model. We need to be stronger on kind of travel time just in general, but built into the way we think about the world. I have the mic, so should I talk? Okay. Laura yes, Teller, Connetty. Absolutely. Um, I was looking for you. I am uh, wondering if you could comment on the use of Amy as opposed to a more gender-neutral gender name. <laughs> so this is just lazy engineering. So we have Amy and Andrew. Uh, and both, if you look at her full name, which is Amy Ingram, is AI initials. And if you're a little bit geeky, there'll be engrams in her last name. Uh, what we really want to do is not just go to market with uh, Amy and Andrew hand in hand, but really have an offering for where there's a professional and business edition where you can name her yourself and move her to your domain. So it might just be John at Oracle for you, uh, and that's all good and fine with us. I'll tell you, she probably doesn't know this, exactly where the name Amy came from, which is an assistant that we used to have at Outbrain, and we just needed a name to test on. So we started to call her Amy. You know, the machine, and it just stuck. So there. <laughs> yes. Want to hear him then? Saul Weinreich, um, founder of Miner. I also have been using Amy for a while, and um, I just wanted to go over one thing. You were talking about a first meeting versus a follow-up email. Yeah. So when I email Amy and say, okay, set up a meeting with me and Owen, for example, so then when Owen responds, is Amy sort of like individual for me at that moment, or is she then, when the second email comes back in, starting all over from scratch and saying, oh, one second, do I know about this, and, you know, figuring it out again, or is it, um, you know, where it's like, okay, we had this conversation, and sort of breaking out to an individual branch for each meeting, each, you know, user. So, so there's... It's, it's, the answer is kind of both. So there's individual branches for each participant in each meeting, but those branches are coupled. So they form part of the same, it's, it's same object, if you want, and they influence each other. So, so information travels across those branches, if you want. What, what do you mean, how does it scale to a billion? Well, yeah. I mean, it's just that it's a database issue. It's not, I mean, it's, it's very scalable. So. so we find there's that what you mean. Yeah. So there's 87 million U.S. knowledge workers today scheduling about 10 billion something formal meetings every year, which is a problem you just can't solve with humans. We might die trying, you know, Marcus and I, and we'll have a laugh about that, but it can only be solved through machines. We think this machine instance is certainly one for where, if the other party also uses Amy, we won. 
because I'm sure you can see how this works right now where Matt and I might do a human to human back and forth or Matt and I might do a machine to human back and forth which is certainly better, faster and more pleasurable for me but the magic moment happens when we both use Amy. So I might start out saying, hey Matt, got time for a cup of coffee? And he says, sure. I say, fantastic. I see it in Amy. His immediate response should be one where, ah, oh, wonderful. I see it in Emily on my side. Or Andrew, sorry. Uh, Andrew uh, on my side. Who the hell is she talking to? She's talking to herself. And it doesn't become a back and forth anymore. It becomes more of a preference, internal preference negotiation where we try to conclude on both parties. And I think it comes back to that one bullet that Marcus showed of how do we maximize then customer happiness. All right. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll pass on the mic to you. You've been trying for a while after this one. Hi. Hi, Alexander Koch from BNP Paribas. Could you comment on how much more complex the problem becomes if we want to train Amy to convince people to give up their existing meetings if one new meeting might be more important. <laughs> so, so, so that's actually not uh, crazy talk. It's a good joke, but it's, it's not crazy talk. So we have you know, some major challenges in uh, what we need to do here. And I think you pinpoint one of them, which is that we need to have some understanding of the social dynamics that are built into meetings. So if I want to ask Matt for $10 for our venture, he's got the upper hand in that meeting. That means he's not coming down to 48 Wall. I'm going to travel up to Chelsea. And that's cool with me, but Amy might actually not see anywhere the suggestion that I'm supposed to go to Chelsea. It is just understood between Matt and I. That's where the meeting's going on. But she needs to have some understanding of how does Dennis relate to Matt? And how might we relate to each other to the extent that we need to bump one of my meetings, because I'm going to get one spot with Matt, and I want it. So for that, we need to have that capacity to actually go in and automatically, on your behalf, reschedule meetings because we've got another meeting that we'd rather put in this spot. And for all I know, you might not even notice. So I move things around in your calendar so that you can get your five minutes of fame with Matt and get his $10. So it is not crazy talk, and it's something which we think about all the time. That's right. And I think what's become super interesting is not just to get a connect to LinkedIn, is that we'll actually have a true understanding of who meets with who and where, and how often do they get rescheduled. Thank you. Uh, last question. Sure. Uh, you might have answered this, but just in terms of how you collect feedback on how well this is working, mm -hmm. um, what is the role, I guess, of explicitly um, soliciting inputs from a user at the start of using this, and then, uh, you know, I guess, munging that with the probabilistic models you're using to uh, try to sort of tease out uh, those inputs. Right. I mean, so right now we're, for that sort of feedback, we are relying on actually having humans QA some of the decisions that the machine is making. When I think when we're close to the level of 100% automation, maybe we're at 97, 98%. Um, in those cases where our confidence level is not high enough to actually you know, feel confident that we can automate the response, then it's a possible model for us would be to just send out an email to whoever we're interacting with and just ask for clarification. And so then that gives us feedback. So then that, that user is kind of training, training uh, Amy a little bit farther. So you, you can think of this almost as how we decide to surrender. So Siri surrenders by giving you 10 web results. And I'm not sure that is overly clever. But we could surrender, I think, in a much, much nicer way, which is exactly what Marcus described, which is not one of just giving up, but you know what? Sorry. I didn't understand what you just said. Could you clarify it? Do you mean Thursday this week? And right. And as long as we only have to do that a very small fraction of the time, I think it's something that we can bear with. All right, terrific. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. But uh, so, Dennis, Marcos, uh, Amy, and Andrew, all of you will be. Thank you. Thank you.